Hey everybody, it's Dan LaMontagne. It's Saturday, April 10th, 2010. Well, um, last weekend we had Peter Schiff challenging Alan Greenspan, the for former Fed chairman, um, to a debate. Um, and uh, he even offered to pay Alan Greenspan's um, normal speaking fees, whatever he charges, um, to get into this debate. Uh, the primary reason behind this is that Alan Greenspan, I'd like to call him the Anakin Skywalker of the economic debate with uh, regards to um, you know, capitalism and free markets. Because at one point he was very much uh, a free market uh, economist and now he is much more of a, of a uh, status type economist where he believes that government intervention is the main solution to fixing the problems and the ailments of uh, the economy. So what has uh, Greenspan said lately that makes Peter Schiff want to debate Alan Greenspan? Well, since the uh, implosion of the housing bubble, Greenspan has said things that um, would indicate that he had no idea that this was coming, and that no one would have had any idea that this was coming. Uh, for example, uh, Greenspan said that he missed the significance of the housing bubble when he was interviewed, or that he had no notion of how significant um, things had become with subprime until it was very, very late, until 2005 or so. So he was, he was saying that he had no idea. He even went as far to say that he wouldn't even have changed anything uh, with regard to how he handled uh, his management of um, exiting the uh, historic low interest rates um, that he kept for, for three years at 1%. So essentially, uh, Alan Greenspan uh, denies any responsibility for the housing bubble. And I would like to uh, add my own little blurb here. Actually, not really my own blurb. I'm going to add Alan's, Alan Greenspan's own blurb. And I'm going to let him speak for himself, because I think he does a much better job of incriminating himself than anyone else could possibly do. So I'm going to read um, an article that was originally written by Alan Greenspan in 1966, uh, before he was Fed chairman, which I think might help everybody understand what he actually knows about this economic crisis and how much it actually parallels a crisis we once had called the Great Depression. So this is the article. He says, An almost hysterical antagonism toward the gold standard is one issue which unites statists of all persuasions. They seem to sense, perhaps more clearly and subtly than many consistent defenders of laissez-faire, that gold economic freedom are in gold uh, that gold and economic freedom are inseparable, that the gold standard is an instrument of laissez-faire, and that each implies and requires the other. In order to understand the source of their antagonism, it is necessary first to understand the specific role of gold, gold in a free society. Money is the common denominator of all economic transactions. It is that commodity which serves as a medium of exchange is universally acceptable to all participants in an exchange, in an exchange economy, as payment for goods, services, and can, therefore, be used as a standard of market value and as a store of value, i.e., as a means of saving. The existence of such a commodity is a precondition of a division of labor economy, such as ours. If men did not have some commodity of, object of, of objective value, which was generally acceptable as money, they would have to resort to primitive barter or be forced to live on self-sufficient farms and forego the inestimable advantages of specialization. If men had no means to store value, i.e. to save, neither long-range planning nor exchange would be possible. What medium of exchange will be acceptable to all participants in an economy is not determined arbitrarily. First, the medium of exchange should be durable. In a primitive society of meager wealth, Wheat might be sufficiently durable to serve as a medium, since all exchanges would occur only during and, and immediately after the harvest, leaving no, value, leaving no value surplus to store. But where store of value considerations are important, as they are in richer, more civilized societies, the medium of exchange must be, must be a durable commodity, usually a metal. A metal is, is generally chosen because it is homogeneous and divisible. Every unit is the same as every other, and it can be blended or formed in any quantity. Precious jewels, for example, are neither homogeneous nor divisible. More important, uh, the commodity chosen 
as a medium must, must be a luxury. Human desires for luxuries are unlimited, and, therefore, luxury goods are always in demand and will always be acceptable. Wheat is a luxury in underfed civilizations, but not in a prosperous society. Cigarettes ordinarily would not serve as, serve as money, but they did in post-World War II, uh, where they were considered a luxury. The term luxury good implies scarcity and high value unit, and, and high, value, high unit value. Having a high unit value, such, such uh, having a high unit, unit value, such a good is easily portable. For instance, an ounce of gold is worth half a ton of pig iron. In the early stages of a developing uh, money economy, several media of exchange might be used, since a wide variety of commodities would fulfill the foregoing conditions. However, one of the commodities will gradually displace all others by being more widely acceptable. Preferences on what to hold as a store of value will shift to the most widely acceptable commodity, which in turn will make it still more acceptable. The shift is progressive until that commodity becomes the sole medium of exchange. The use of a single medium is highly advantageous. For the same reason that a money economy is superior to a barter economy, it makes exchanges possible on an incalculably wider scale. Whether the single medium is gold, silver, seashells, cattle, or tobacco is optional, depending on the context and development of a given economy. In fact, all have, all have been employed at various times as media of exchange. Even in the present century, two major commodities, gold and silver, have been used as international media of exchange, with gold becoming the predominant, with gold becoming the predominant one. Gold having both artistic and functional uses and being relatively scarce has significant advantages over all other media of exchange. Since the beginning of World War I, it has been virtually the sole international standard of exchange. If all goods and services were to be paid for in gold, large payments would be difficult to execute, and this would tend to limit the extent of society's division of labor and specialization. Thus, a logical extension of the creation of a medium of exchange is the development of a banking system and credit instruments, i.e. bank notes and bank deposits, which act as a substitute for, but are convertible into gold. A free banking system based on gold is able to extend credit and thus to create banknotes, currency, and deposits according to the production requirements of the economy. Individual, eco individual owners of gold are induced by payments of interest to deposit their gold into a bank, against which they can draw checks. But since it is rarely, but since it is rarely the case that all depositors want to withdraw all their gold at the 